Jonathan. Come on in. Welcome, Jonathan and, and Ed. And Ed, you are right on time. It's time for your reading. <laughs> okay, we're going to have you sit here for a moment because uh, Brad is doing uh, close up. Do you need to uh, get your makeup all together or anything uh, before we, we do this? And I'm going to have you kind of hold this, okay, and uh, speak into the phone. Blessings and curses. Yeah, blessings and curses. Shalom. Blessings and curses. Deuteronomy 11:26. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you shall listen to the commandment of Yahweh your God, which I command you this day, and the curse if you shall not listen to the commandment of Yahweh your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. It shall happen when Yahweh your God shall bring you into the land where you go to possess it, that you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebo. Aren't they, aren't they beyond the Jordan, behind the way of the going down of the sun in the land of the Canaanite who dwell in the Arabah, over against Gilgal, beside the oaks of Mori? In these verses, God offers the children of Israel two choices, blessings or cursings. To understand why God was giving them this choice, we have to remember back to the covenant God made with Israel. Some of the promises were conditional and dependent on Israel's performance, while others were unconditional. The ability for Israel to choose between blessings and curses obviously relates to their conditional, to the conditional promises. When the covenant promises were made, both God and Israel agreed to the terms. Israel will live peacefully in the land, have fruitful crops, and expel their enemies. If they lived up to their part of the agreement, therefore, therefore the blessings, the curses would, uh, would fall on Israel. However, if they broke their agreement, then they would forfeit God's blessing and would be in danger of crop failure, drought, invasion from their enemies, and eventual expulsion from the land. Why blessings and curses? Well, because God has created us as free moral agents. If we had obeyed God from creation to now, there would have been no sin, no need for curses. All of God's covenants are based upon right and wrong, righteousness or sin. There is no such thing in scripture as blessings without obedience. Due to our sinful nature, we would, have, we would have an incentive to be rebellious if we knew there would be no punishment for our rebellion. Even our government would not survive if it were loose, if it were loose its ability to enforce, it, uh, to enforce the law. The result would be anarchy. God does not run a weak government. He upholds his law and meets out punishment and reward as required. To further make sure that the Israelites had a permanent, visible reminder of God's governing, government, he put his blessings on Mount Gerizim and his curses on Mount Ebo. Now, these two mountains were selected, I believe, for three reasons. First, they were opposite each other. Second, they were both approximately 2,500 feet high. And finally, they were both smack dab in the very center of the land not only from east to west, but also from north to south. Ebo is on the north, but Gerizim is on the south, and between the two is Sikkim, of the beautiful lush valley. The blessings were not placed on Mount Gerizim because it's more lush, because I, I, told, I told them that both mountains are barren looking. It was done mostly because Gerizim is to the south, towards the sun and the light. Amen. Southward stands for the right hand of God, right hand which has been used in scripture to represent blessing, Psalm 16, 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life in, the, in thy presence, in the fullness of joy, at thy right hand, there are pleasures evermore. Mount Ebo is on the north. Northward stands for the left hand. Matthew 25, 34. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them from one another, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. We all know what happens to the goats. It's amazing that God set before Israelite a choice between blessing and cursing. But do you know what's even more amazing? Most of Israel, through their disobedience, chose curses. We have the same fundamental choice today. We can live our lives for ourselves or we can live for God. To choose our own way is to travel to a dead-end street. But to choose God's way is to receive from him life everlasting. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Blessing and curses. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Teresa, you guys can read together from there. 
All right, bring you on. This Torah portion is very important to me in that this represents not my birthday Torah portion, but my bat mitzvah uh, Torah portion. Um, I have two Torah portions. One, my birth Torah portion, which is next week's lesson, and then this one, which if when I was 13 years old and being in community, would have been bat mitzvah, and that means brought into being a daughter of the commandments. And when I read, okay, this, this Torah portion, it really grieved me in the fact that we are quick to say that our steps are ordered by the Lord. We always, when we're in church, oh yeah, my steps are ordered by the Lord. Okay, not knowing what that really, really means. Okay, but when you understand that when you were born, there was a Torah portion that was being read. And before all, all of you new people who are here leave, I'm going to give you your birthday and your bat mitzvah Torah portion. Because that was being read while you are coming out the chute there, okay? These words, okay, were being read over you to order your steps. And when I read these, it, uh, as I said, it grieved me because I saw so many things that I had gotten into in life. I may not have gotten into if I had known the consequences of my actions later on. We do say that but in understanding that our steps are ordered by the Lord, lack of knowledge is no excuse. When you're like when I woke up this morning, I come stumbling out and there's a policeman and somebody pulled up in the driveway and the policeman had stopped them. Nine times out of ten they were speeding. Lack of knowledge of what that speed limit is, is no excuse. Okay, when the people, when you will have the consequence of getting a ticket, even though you didn't know the speed limit was 35, and maybe you were going 55, okay, but still, you know, uh, there is a consequence. So, in starting with this, going back to our Torah portion, which begins at Deuteronomy 11, I'm going to read verses 26 through 28. Okay. And I'm reading from the J, I'm going to be reading all day today from the JPS Tanakh. Okay. C. I set before you blessing and curse. This not only my Torah portion and Bat Mitzvah portion also gave me some understanding as to who I am. And that's always the purpose of the Word of God. The Word of God is a revealer. It reveals who you are. Always understand, the enemy knows who you are. That is the reason why he deals with you in a certain way. The enemy also, once again, understands the concepts of your steps being ordered, okay, by the Lord. Just because you don't know what God said about you, maybe the enemy's coming against you because he knows what God said about you. So everything he can do to throw up those stumbling blocks, he will do. I was thinking today that we have a generation that the enemy is trying to take out. And that is the generation, I will say, from Generation X, Generation of uh, the Millennials. We see terrible things happening within these two generations. The opioid, okay, epidemic. Things that are coming to take this generation out. Now, we need to understand why this particular generation more than other, okay, generations. And we need to understand there were certain things that have been set in motion with the last century, uh, as in particular with regards to Israel. Israel once again being founded as a nation, being, you know, that promised land. Now we're into the promised land. Now I need you to think about it, all right? The enemy had claimed that land as their own. So when Israel became a nation, an independent nation, what happened? They declare uh, themselves a nation, okay, I think it was May 15th, 1948. They're at war, May 16th, 1948. Okay, we see right away their enemy, as soon as they crossed over or crossed into that legal boundary that says you are now restored as a nation, the enemy rose up. Now, we need to understand in the Bible, there is also a generation. We have the generation that came out of Egypt, and we have a generation that enters into the promised land. The generation that came out of Egypt, it took them 40 years to get over to the promised land because of their own disobedience, okay? 
So once again, their own disobedience took them out. Yet there was a generation that came after them that was slated to go into the promised land and conquer the promised land. If you remember in the book of Joshua, when he sent these, the spies over and they go to Rahab, Rahab goes to them, where you guys been? Well, our hearts have been failing us for fear. Can you imagine the stress of being able to look and see your enemy that you know is coming over to take away your home, take away your fields, take away everything that you and your family have worked for for 40 years. Every time Israel went on the move, the enemy would be thinking, is this the day? Is this the day? Okay, so by the time you talk about stress, all right, you talk about stress and everything. So. In knowing that you have someone that's going to, that is going to come and take away your home, are you just going to run away or are you going to try to fight? You're going to try to fight. We fight for, you know, what we know is ours. So there is a generation that, once again, Yeshua said, the generation that sees the fig tree blooming, that is going to be the generation that all these other things, okay, begin to take place. We know that that generation, we have a generation starting in 1948, which is the baby boomers. Those who have been born from 1948 all the way to the present are those who are going to see very the very things that Yeshua talked about, Yahweh talked about in the what we call the old covenant as well as in the new covenant. We are going to see those things. But once again, it is a particular generation that is going to inhabit the land and also inhabit all of the promises. Do you think the enemy is going to take that line down? So isn't it best to eliminate your competition before they even realize who they are? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about this and I need to look this up on the uh, internet to find out what was their reasoning for why they you know, gave the generations their particular names. The baby boomers, I can understand, because we had just come out of World War II, okay, and so economy was booming and all of that, so lots of babies, but it started once again with Generation X. I started thinking, why would they call Generation X? When you put an X on something, what are you doing to it? Crossing. Hey, right? come on, Holy Ghost. You are eliminating them. You are crossing them out. And then I begin to think of that particular generation, the biggest thing that started happening with that particular generation was that the abortion laws were passed. Mm -hmm. The abortion laws were passed. Yeah, this was a versus Wade. road versus Wade. So yeah. this was a generation that many of them were what? X out. Okay. Then we have the millennials. Why? Because we're in the end times, and what do we wind up with in the book of uh, the book of Revelation? A new, renewed, okay, earth, heaven, and earth. A new millennium. The millennials. So the very names of these generations are determining what's going to happen within that generation. So here we have a generation, Generation X, and those are like Teresa, our kids. Okay, our kids okay, are in that particular generation. And they are fighting hard. The opioid generate, or the opioid epidemic is really hitting that particular generation very, very hard. And when we do not realize what is going on, you really don't even know how to effectively pray. You understand what I'm saying? There is an enemy that wants to take out that particular the next two generations and the reason for that is the promise on them just like in the bible they are the ones to come in and inherit the promises of god you understand what i'm saying so do you think the enemy is going to take all of this laying down but we war not against flesh and blood see the enemy gets away with a whole lot he is spirit we war against spiritual things but if he can get you in the flesh to do his work for him. You understand? So when we, once again, we're warring today, everything today is about flesh and blood. Okay, I'm not going to like you because you're not the same as me. You have a different ideology, okay, than me. That is the enemy looking to divide because if you can divide, you can do what? 
conquer. You can conquer. You can conquer. So we, Paul says, we must be wise of the enemy's devices. This week's Torah portion is very important for everyone sitting here, those who are near and those who are far. Because now we begin to get into when we started talking about covenants, and I gave you all of that about covenants. It's time to understand these are the terms of the covenant. And the first thing that he opens up with is see or observe. This is different than Shema. Shema is listening with the intention to obey. Re'e is observe or perceive. Not only perceive in the natural, but perceive spiritually. So we all have to have our spiritual eyes open as well as physical, okay, physical eyes. So it says, see, this day I set before you blessing and curse. In other words, today I'm giving you a choice. All right. God gives us a choice because he made us free will agents. So if you have a choice of certain things, okay, you need to know the consequences of those choices. And there are always consequences to choices. There's always those unintended consequences to choices that we make. He goes on to say, a blessing if you obey the commandments of Yahweh, your Elohim, that I enjoin upon you this day and curse. If you do not obey the commandments of Yahweh, your Elohim, but turn away from the path that I enjoin upon you this day and follow other gods whom you have not experienced. Remember, for the last 40 years, they experienced a God that there were witnesses there, witnesses of what happened in Egypt. Remember, the generation that was t below 20 came out of as well as a new generation that was born in the wilderness. But there were still those that came out of Egypt that could say, I saw the Red Sea part. I saw all of the miracles that happened. I saw Pharaoh die. Because God always has to have a witness for the next generation. You understand what I'm saying? That's why when he says, you are my witnesses, we are the ones that are going to see certain things occur and be able to pass that information down. He says, tell your children. What are you going to tell your children if you were never told yourself? You understand what I'm saying? The enemy purposely kept us out of this word. Because in, in joining in, when we have faith in Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, we come through the blood of the Lamb of God. Do you think the enemy really wanted you to know the terms and consequences of that? No, he didn't. Okay, he wanted us to be ignorant. That's why I get I get real hyper when people say, "Oh, I love people who are uneducated." You demon. Okay, because the lack of education, my ignorance becomes your strength. You understand what I'm saying? You know the areas that I am ignorant in, so you will use those things against me. And because I don't know who I am, the worst enemy that we have is not the devil. The worst enemy we have is not the devil. Because Yeshua gave us power over all the works of the enemy. The worst enemy we have is ourselves and our ignorance. Because our ignorance can set consequences into action that our ignorance will not allow us to know how to get out of. How do you know how to get out of something if you didn't know how you got into it to begin with? Mm -hmm. And you don't understand why. Okay? So, he goes on to say, I set before you blessing and curse. A blessing if you obey, a curse if you don't obey. So, if I know I have a choice, what is the logical choice I want? I want a blessing. So, <laughs> blessing comes with obedience. But guess what? Obedience to what? Why don't you obey God? What does that mean? You understand what I'm saying? When you go and you have a job, your boss gives you very specific things for you to do to determine whether you're doing your job or not. Am I right? There's no one who gets in here and the boss says, oh, just hang out for about 40 hours and I'll give you a paycheck. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are you guys having fun yet? Are we having fun? No, it gives 
you, they sit you down on your first day and they give you a list of things that you have to do. And if you choose not to do well, I look at this, I don't feel like doing this. I thought we were going to hang out and have fun. <laughs> um, security. <laughs> okay, next one. You understand what I'm saying? So you get, and we understand this, you get specific things that you have to do and at the end of the week, when you've done those specific things, you get a what? A reward, a paycheck. <laughs> now, if they like what you've been doing all year, you get a bonus. bonus and a raise. You get a reward for your obedience and performance. And if they don't like what it is you've been doing, you may not only not get a raise, but you may need a new job. You may lose that job. You understand? Okay? So very so we under, everybody understands the concept of blessing and curses because we do that. If you obey the teacher and you do your homework and you study and you get A's on the test, they aren't going to fail you. Okay, but if you do none of that, if the teacher says this is the homework, these are the chapters to read, and you choose not to do that, and you fail the test, you can't blame the teacher because the teacher told you what it is that you had to do in order to pass the test. Okay? It is no different with God. I'm setting before you. That means there's something he has to place before us. He's telling us what? If we obey him, these are the consequences. Great consequences if you obey. But if you choose to disobey, then these are the consequences and those are cursing. Now, God is responsible. Come on in. He is going to tell us what it is we have to do. All right, so then he goes on in verse number 29. When Yahweh, your Elohim, brings you into the land that you are about to enter and possess. Did he say if or when? He says when. That means, guess what, guys? We're definitely going. This is a definite. It is not if. It is not conditional. When means it's just a matter of time. Guess who chooses when when is? We do. No, we do. We do. Because God was ready to bring them into the promised land 38 years before. But their choices, okay, made them stay in the wilderness another 38 years. It was always God's intention from the time that he spoke to Abraham, when Abraham didn't have any children, to bring the descendants of Abraham into the promised land. We are heirs of Abraham through faith in Yeshua. So every single blessing of Abraham is ours already. We just don't know what that looks like because we were never told about the conditions of receiving them or the consequences if we didn't obey. That's why I have a problem a lot of times with pastors because they don't, they'll take one little verse out and then preach a whole sermon about that one little verse Okay, which could be out of context to the original meaning of what that verse is. All right. And then hell breaks out in our life and we don't understand why. So God is very clear. We're about to enter in and he's telling us specifically when you get into the land. Now understand why this is our covenant today. Deuteronomy is our covenant today because they are in the land. Okay, not just because they are in the land now, but because they entered into the land originally. You understand what I'm saying? So whether Israel was not in the land, okay, when they got cast out into exile or not, doesn't matter. The minute those tribes crossed over to the Jordan and conquered the land and divided the land, when went into place all of these covenant terms. So he goes on to say in verse 29, when he brings you into the land and you're about to possess it, you shall pronounce blessings at Mount Gerizim and curse at Ebal. And those were right in the center, okay, the center of the land there. I'm going to go on to verse number 31, okay. 
For you are about to cross the Jordan to enter and possess the land that Yahweh your Elohim is assigning to you when you have occupied it. So guess what I just learned? I'm not only going to get there, but I'm going to occupy there. Okay? It's not a question of what's going to happen if I get there. God is going to bring me there and I am going to occupy it. See, this is why I tell people, when God gives you something, write it down. Okay, you write it down. Write your plans down. Because that begins to be a bookmark. What, happened? what, what do you think would happen if Moses never wrote any of this down? What would happen if Jeremiah never wrote it down? What would happen if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John never wrote anything they heard down? We would be lost. Because then everyone would be subject to what someone else heard. You understand what I'm saying? But God wrote it down to give it to us. This word stands as a witness to the two witnesses, the heaven and the earth. Okay. So therefore we have a sure word. God is not only going to get promise us something, but he is going to bring us there. Okay, and give us the terms on when I bring you there. This is what you must do in order to keep it. Let me give you a hot channel too. I hear people all the time, God gave me this, God gave me this, God promised this, and you get it. Your obedience will get you the blessing. You cannot retain possession of anything that God gives you for your obedience when you decide to be disobedient. The very things he gave you because of your obedience will be the very things he removes from you, okay, for your disobedience. And it's not God did. No, your disobedience was the choice you made at that particular point, all right? So that's why very often our disobedience allows the enemy access to us that he wouldn't have had. See, this is why things happen. I didn't know that the enemy, it's like we lock that door and we put, okay, the uh, alarm on. We got two big pit bulls. Somebody come in that house the wrong way. Now, I don't know, Coco might ask him, can I fix you coffee or tea? <laughs> you know, I don't know, that's just the way that they are, that friendly. But if you see two pit bulls, you look in the window and you see two pit bulls looking at you out the window, you're going to think twice about trying to break into this house just because you see the pit bulls. But we put alarms on so that when that door opens, there is a signal someone is entering into the house. We know it's a friendly person pretty much, okay, if they, you know, cut off the code or whatsoever. However, if they don't, okay, everybody's up and everyone's on guard. We know there are warning signs. However, if those alarms are not on, someone could break in, okay, and we could get robbed. But if the door is locked, they'd have to break in. What if we left the door open? Have they technically broken in? No. Nope. What if we gave them a key? <laughs> if we gave them a key, they have... That means a key means authority. You understand what I'm saying? Whoever you give a key to has full authority wherever that key allows them entrance to. So our disobedience is the key that the enemy uses to unlock and get entrance into our lives. Everyone understand that? Okay, so then he goes on, when you are about to cross the Jordan to enter and possess the land that Yahweh your Elohim is assigning to you, when you have occupied it and are settled in it, take care to observe all the laws and rules that I have set before you this day. So he gives us a warning, okay, and then chapter 12 begins. These are the laws and rules that you must carefully observe in the land that Yahweh Elohim of your fathers, who are your fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay, giving you to possess how long? As long as you live where? Now you decide to go mar to Mars, all bets may be off, okay? <laughs> but as long as you are living here on earth, these laws are in effect. Number one, 
You must destroy all the sites at which the nations you are to dispossess worship their gods, whether on lofty mountains or on hills or under any luxuriant tree. Tear down their altars, smash their pillars, put their sacred posts to the fire, cut down the images of their gods, obliterating their name from that site. Why? Because what was the first thing he said in the Ten Commandments? I am Yahweh, your Elohim, have no other gods before me. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is to make sure you tear that down because if you don't, you'll be tempted to worship and guess what? Things will go south very fast because you fight. We haven't even gotten to the other nine commandments. You've already violated the first one. Okay, then he goes on to say, let's go to verse four. Do not worship Yahweh your Elohim in like manner, but look only to the sight that Yahweh your Elohim will choose amidst all your tribes as his habitation to establish his name there. How many worship sites are there technically for the people of God? There's only one. And that's in Jerusalem. Every place else we worship as a, we go to worship as a sign that we're not where we're supposed to be. Because if we were where we were supposed to be, there would be a temple in Israel, in Jerusalem, where the presence of God would be physically there. So the fact we have so many worship places is a reminder to us that we are in exile, okay? But what do we do? We go into our worship place and guess what? This is how we're gonna to decide to worship God. This is how we're gonna decide over here. On, on uh, Sheldon Road, there are what? At least 15 or 20 different churches, all with different ways on how they're going to worship God. But God says, there's only, don't worship it that way. There's only one way to worship me. That's why it's important to understand these words here. He goes on, you are to go and there are, you are to bring your burnt offerings and other sacrifices, your tithes and contributions, your votive and free will offerings, the firstlings of your herd and flocks, together with your households, you shall feast there before Yahweh your Elohim, happy in all the undertakings which Yahweh your Elohim has blessed you. Now understand something, there was a tabernacle until the permanent dwelling. All right, we all understand that. So the tabernacle was a temporary dwelling place that moved around, okay? So until the permanent place, what did they do? They brought everything into the tabernacle. All right, so he goes on. You shall not act at all as we now act here, every man as he pleases. Come on, because you have not yet come to the allotted haven that Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. That's the reason why everybody has their own grove and everything else. Okay, but once again, what unites the people of God is his word. All right? So technically, that is one reason why we follow the Torah portions that are being read in the Torah portions in Israel right now. We are reading the same Torah portion as millions of Hebrews, okay, Israelites, okay, Jews all across the world are reading because that brings us into unity, into unity. He goes on to say in verse 10, when you cross the Jordan and settle in the land that Yahweh your Elohim is allotting to you and he grants you safety from all your enemies around you and you live in security, are we there yet? No, no we aren't. Are we in the land? Yes, we are. Yeah. We are in the land. Okay, remember, if you are a Hebrew Israelite, Israel is your land. We, once again, are already in the land. When a bomb hits that land, you ought to be saying, oh, my back. Okay, ouch. That's how in, in tune with what goes on over there we should. However, we are not where this verse is. Is Israel in security right now? No. Are all her enemies around her subdued? No. So we are not there yet. But are we in the process of getting there? Yes. So this is for a future time. And how long that time lasts is based upon what? Obedience. So how come every generation has disobedience of what happens? We start all over again. 
we start all over. They mm -hmm. come into the land, disobedient, Nebuchadnezzar, out. They come back into the land after 70 years, disobedient again. Here goes Titus, out, okay? Exiles them out, okay? False Messiah, 135, all of them removed off of the land. We come back again. And is Israel over there obedient? So guess what? <clears throat> okay. We are in the diaspora. Or we are in exile. We are technically, United States is technically the wilderness. Spain is the wilderness. Canada is the wilderness. When you are not inside of the land, you are in the wilderness. Okay. The good news is that God is going to gather all of us out of wherever he has scattered us to bring us back into the land. Hallelujah for that. Okay, he goes then once again in verse 11. Then you must bring everything that I command you to the site where Yahweh, your Elohim, will choose to establish his name, your burnt offerings and other sacrifices, your tithes and contributions, and all the choice votive offerings that you vow to Yahweh. And you will rejoice before Yahweh, your Elohim, with who? With your sons and your daughters, with your male and female slaves, along with the Levite, that word slaves ought to be servants. Come on in. Ought to be the word servants. Oh, hallelujah. Guess what we're about to have? Servants. Okay. Hey, hey. Okay. And along with the Levite and the settlements, for he has no territorial allotment among you. There are some other chairs. Okay, over here also. Now, I want to skip down. Oh, no, I'll go ahead and read this. Take care not to sacrifice your burnt offerings in any place you like, but only in the place that Yahweh will choose in one of your tribal territories. There you shall sacrifice your burnt offerings, and there you shall observe all that I enjoin upon you. That's why I was very upset years ago. I heard of messy antics. Okay, going and sacrificing lambs in their backyard for their Passover. Yeah. It was like, are you crazy? Okay, yes they did. And let me tell you something. Nobody paid attention how during the years there were some ser terrible things that wound up happening to a lot of those people that were in doing that. Wow. Okay, that doing that. I would never ever go to any congregation that sacrificed the Passover lamb, okay, with these particular scriptures, okay, here, right here. Now, there are tribes, okay, in Africa, like the Lemba and everything, that still do sacrifices. They never stopped doing the Torah, even though they were exiled outside, okay, of the land. And they will acknowledge, okay, that there is a temple, and hopefully they will be some of the priests that are in that temple. How you doing, sweetheart? Okay? Then he goes on to say, But whenever you desire, you may slaughter and eat meat in any of your settlements according to the blessing that Yahweh your Elohim has granted you. Now, if you wanted to just kill a lamb to eat it, or whatever, or a goat, or whatever, we do that now, okay? Okay? You know, but the problem was... If it was the Passover lamb. You understand what I'm saying? Certain particular sacrifices you just do not do outside of the lamb. The unclean and the clean may alike may partake of it as of the gazelle and the deer. But you must not partake of the blood. You shall pour it out on the ground like water. You may not partake in your settlements of the tithes of your new grain or wine or oil or of the firstling of your herds and flocks, or of any of the votive offerings that you vow, or of your free will offerings, or of, or of your contributions. There, these you must consume before Yahweh your Elohim in the place that Yahweh your Elohim will choose. And once again, you, your sons and your daughters, your male and female slaves, the Levite in your settlements, happy before Yahweh your Elohim in all your undertakings. Be sure not to neglect the Levite as long as you live in your land. Levites are in the land. That's another reason why when we come together and everybody brings their free will offering or whatsoever, we all eat together because the commandment is consume all of this within. You bring a wine. I think Marcia said she was bringing a wine offering today. Hallelujah. All right, there it is. All right, and we all consume it. Where? Because wherever two or more are gathered together, he is in the midst of us. 
All right, now remember, once again, I started saying, this is my bat mitzvah portion. So this is personal to me. You understand what I'm saying? These are instructions that Yah is giving, all right? Giving all of us, but in particular, I'm personalizing it because this was my bat mitzvah portion. Okay, then, oh, I love verse 20. When Yahweh enlarges your territory, man, not just one house, we're going to have houses and fields, guys, as he has promised you, and you shall say, I shall eat some meat. Yeah, that's why I got that barbecue out there. Okay, and I bought a whole a bunch of stuff to barbecue, wink, wink. Okay? <laughs> wink, wink. That is not something in my eye. I am winking at a particular person. Okay? I shall eat some meat. When? He goes, and you say, I shall eat some meat. For, I, for you have the urge to eat meat. I love this verse. You have the urge to eat meat. You must eat meat whatever you wish. Okay? This is God speaking. Okay? So... I'm not, I'm not hating on you if you are a vegan or a vegetarian. You understand what I'm saying? But this is God saying, I can eat meat when I feel like it. So don't try to put me under condemnation because I don't have that particular lifestyle. If he's called, let me tell you something. If he has called you to be a vegan or vegetarian, I will not try to tempt you with my steak or my chicken wings. Okay, because that could be poison to you. You would be disobeying God if, okay. And I'm not going to put you <clears throat> under condemnation either, okay, about me being a meat eater and you're not either, okay. Everyone does as God calls them to do and we all get along together. Now, if, this is important for you, if the place where Yahweh has chosen to establish his name is too far from you. So say, for example, okay, remember they were an agricultural society, but they were spread all over. What if they were outside of the land and maybe Greece, and they're a farmer in Greece, and that would be too far for them to travel with all of their first fruits and everything. Can you see that picture? So Yahweh is saying, if that place is too far for you, you may slaughter any of the cattle or sheep that Yahweh gives you as I have instructed you, and you may eat to your heart's content in your settlements. Eat it, however, as the gazelle and deer are eaten. The unclean may eat it together with the clean. Remember, unclean and clean are with regards to location of the temple and tabernacle. That's ceremonially unclean. But make sure you do not partake of the blood, for the blood is the life, and you must not consume the life of the flesh. You must not partake of it. You must pour it out on the ground like water. You must not partake of it in order that it may go well with you and with your descendants to come, for you will be doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. But such sacred and votive donations you may have, you may have, um, shall be taken by you to the site Yahweh will choose. Okay? I want to go down to verse number 24. He gives us a warning. Be careful to heed all these commandments or words that I enjoin upon you. Thus it will go well with you and with your descendants after you forever. For you will be doing what is good and right in the sight of Yahweh your Elohim. That's the second time he said that to us. So if we not only want it to go well with us but with our descendants. Not only must we be in obedience, but we must also teach the children, okay, also, so that they understand what it is their responsibility to do, okay. He gives us another warning again. When Yahweh your Elohim has cut down before you the nations that you are about to enter and dispossess, and you have dis dispossessed them and settled in their land, beware of being lured into their ways after they have been wiped out before you. How many times have I seen people, okay, be blessed within the church or whatever, then they go out and next thing you know, the things that God blessed them with, understand, the things that God blesses you with, the enemy will always try to tempt you into disobedience. Because guess what? He can't take anything out of your hand when you are in obedience. But when you are in disobedience, 
okay, the consequence is you lose it. So he will be there to make sure he's there for your disobedience, to tempt you, because it is just the effect of you. Oh, I know you're a car thief. I tell you what, let me just go ahead and give you the keys and everything. I'll continue to make payments on it for you. Are you is the air high enough for you? Okay, <laughs> you come on, do you have enough gas? That's exactly what you are saying when you disobey the commandments. Now he's given us two warnings. Out of the mouth, two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Chapter 13 was very important for me because both in my bat mitzvah portion and in my uh, birthday portion, it talks about prophets and how to judge a prophet. So, he goes on to say, uh, um, uh, I want to go backwards a little bit, verse number uh, 31, okay, of uh, Deuteronomy 12. You shall not act thus toward Yahweh your Elohim, for they perform for their gods every abhorrent act that Yahweh detests. They even offer up their sons and daughters in fire to their gods. Be careful to observe only that which I enjoin upon you, neither do what? Add to it or take away from it. Okay? Isn't that the warning we got in the book of Revelation also? He who adds to, God says, I will add the plagues to you. He who takes away from, I will subtract your name out of the book of life. So there are very serious consequences for adding to or coming up with your own version of how you want to do what Yahweh says. Chapter 13. If there appears among you, if it's conditioned, a prophet or dreamer, dream diviner, and he gives you a sign or a portent saying, let us follow and worship another God whom you have not experienced. If the sign or portent that he named to you comes true. So, all right, right here he's giving us a warning that this prophet or whatever may wind up coming to us, giving us a sign, and that sign is going to come to pass. Normally, when a prophet comes in the church, and they give all of these signs, and they, that sign comes to pass. We say, that's a valid prophet, am I right? Yep. That's right, okay? In the end times, there is one who is coming, one who is anti-Messiah. He has a prophet, a false prophet. They will be giving signs and wonders that will be so good that they will deceive even the very elect. So if you are looking for just a sign and a wonder as proof of the prophet, you better understand why Yah allowed that to happen and he gives that. Verse 4, do not heed the words of that prophet or that dream diviner. And here's why. For Yahweh your Elohim is testing who? You. To see whether you really love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and your soul. Guess what? doesn't have to be a, a prophet or dream diviner. It could be a friend. Okay? And this is why I tell young people all the time, what are your plans? You write down those plans. The reason is someone may come along and say, okay, instead of doing this, why don't we go over here and do that? And see, if you have a plan without a goal, if you know you need to do something, then just like Marcia, Marcia, you have very definite goals that you have to take because you have studies that determine, I have to have this done by Monday. Otherwise, I'm forfeiting this entire semester for this particular class. So if someone comes along to say, Marcy, let's go ahead, uh, you, you know, let's even go ahead on a cruise or whatsoever. <laughs> if that's very tempting, isn't it? But should you choose that, and not do what it is your assignment is, you're gonna forfeit what it is you're working towards. So, it is not necessarily that that person is a bad person. Yahweh is testing you to see if you're going to be obedient. But if you don't have a definite goal, guess what? Uh, I could put this off for another semester. And guess what? Something else will come on. I'll put it off for another semester. And next thing you know, you've dropped out of school. You've lost everything that you've been working for just because of that one thing. So that is why when we have a, a firm plan 
somebody comes up and it's like, oh no, if you're either going to help me do what it is I need to do from God or you're going to keep me from doing it. And the only way you know that is to know what he's told you to do. He's testing you to see if he will, you will obey and observe his commandments alone. He Only his orders worship none but him. Hold fast to him. Guess what? They come along talking about in this another God. Okay? Nobody's saying you would not be Lord if they told you, come on, we're going to go worship Buddha, right? right? But when you decide to seek your own pleasure, who's the God you're worshiping? Mm -hmm. Self. Self. That other God becomes the God of self. See, that's why it's so subtle. You don't even realize you're worshiping another God. Remember, in the end times, people will be lovers of pleasure. Lovers of their own selves more than lovers of God. Yeah. All right? So you become your own idol. What happened to the last man that stood before Yahweh and said, I know not Yahweh? Hmm. We know what happened with him. Okay? Now, as for that prophet or dream diviner, he shall be put to death. There is a serious consequence for people coming and trying to take you out of what Yahweh has ordained for you. You need to understand, the day, you are a danger. To, did you know you are a danger to people? Okay, he says, as for that prophet or dream diviner, he shall be put to death. Ooh. For he urged disloyalty to Yahweh, your Elohim, who freed you from the land of Egypt and who redeemed you from the house of bondage to make you stray from the path that Yahweh your Elohim commanded you to follow. Thus you shall sweep out evil from your midst. So there is a personal accountability. So here's how the enemy is going to operate. First he's going to come to you and prophet or dream diviner is who? Religious. Isn't that how... And Satan tempted in the garden. He came to them talking about what God said. Oh, you shall not really doubt. That's the sign. If you eat this, if God said what he said was so, you'll just fall dead. They didn't know what death was. But Yahweh had said, in the day you eat this, you shall surely die. You think they knew a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Just because something doesn't happen immediately doesn't mean you haven't set that thing to happen in motion. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so he goes on. First one is spiritual authority. So that's why always beware a lot of times when you go to these conferences, oh, this is prophetess so-and-so. This is apostle so-and-so. This is even pastor so-and-so. Because that title once again engenders a certain response that you are supposed to take to that person's words okay paul said follow me as i follow messiah but let guess what if you don't know what messiah looks like messiah may look like that person and you wind up following a person right into the lake of fire okay so a sign a title with a sign that happens doesn't mean necessarily that they are a false prophet either. Yahweh says, I'm testing you. The test is for you to do the right thing. All right? Now, if your brother, your own mother's son, or your son or daughter, oh, we're getting real personal now, or the wife of your bosom or your closest friend entices you in secret saying, let us worship other gods whom neither you nor your fathers have experienced. Once again, that God could be self. That God could even be that child. That God could be a parent. That God is anybody, any relationship you have that's walking on two feet. You've got to be careful because guess what? Your friend, your child or whatever tugs at your your heart and your head. Okay, so once again, how the enemy can approach you, always remember, anything that messes with your head or messes with your heart. When you think of a sniper, where do snipers, where are the kill spots? Head and heart. Head and heart. Even if you turned around, 
They line it up because they know they can shoot you in a certain place where it'll go right in the back, where it'll go right to the heart. Or if you're facing them, they know heart, whether the head shot or the heart shot. Either one is a kill shot. Remember, the enemy wants to take you out. So anything that messes with your head or messes with your heart is meant to take you out. How many of us have had situations occur in our life where we thought we were going to die of a broken heart? Really mess with our head. Come on now. Everybody, everybody here has had something. Come on. Y'all trying to be proud. Act like I'm the only one. I'm the only one. You need to stop it. Okay? Okay? Yeah, we all have gone through some things. But for the grace of God, how many people never recovered? How many people never had a support system? that helped them hold it together when they were losing it. And there is no sin in losing it as long as you have somebody coming along picking up the pieces, okay? Okay, so that when you can recover, they can put those pieces together. That's why it's important that we have each other, okay? That we have each other, okay? So, come let us worship other gods. Let's go down to... Okay, verse 8. Among the gods of the people around you, either near to you or distant, anywhere from one end of the earth to the other, do not assent or give heed to him. Show him no pity or compassion, and do not shield him, but take his life. Lord, have mercy. Okay? You know? And that, that's a hard scripture. Of course, we do not do that. But let me tell you something. Very often, children, little kids will always test you. They will always test you. Because if you give in, if you said no, they throw their tantrum, whatever, cry or whatever, and then you give in, they've learned that no with you does not mean no. Mm -hmm. Okay? You have ruined your thought. Don't go beating on them the next time you say no. <laughs> because you taught them your word doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. You understand? So what have we taught our children by not teaching them the word of God. And how do they learn it? They don't learn it by opening up this Bible and preaching to them. They learn it by observing what it is we do. Well, daddy or mommy, if you can disobey God, why do I have to obey you? If God is your creator, you created me. If you disobey them, that's when you get the backhand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> or whatsoever. But what is that kid saying? That kid is convicting you. The kid's saying, I've been watching what you are doing, and what you are doing is not lining up to the word you're trying to teach me. So somebody's lying, and I don't think it's that word. You understand what I'm saying? So when we teach children that the word of God doesn't mean what it says, what kind of foundation have we put them on? Because they're watching us on a shaky foundation. Then we're telling them the word doesn't really mean what it says. What kind of foundation? What does this kid have to go back to when things get hard for them? They have nothing to go back to, nothing to hold on to. That's why the word of God always must be the final authority. And that's why when we disobey the word of God in front of our kids, we need to go to that kid and confess before that kid, I was wrong, I did wrong, okay? And please apologize, okay, accept my apology because God means what he said, mommy did wrong, okay? Because then when that kid does something incorrect, they're not going to try to hide it from you because you didn't hide it from them. They can feel comfortable coming to you and let's go before God together. Okay, and let's make God can make this thing right. Okay, God's mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy doesn't take away consequences. Mercy can lessen a consequence. You understand what I'm saying? How many times has something terrible happened that could have resulted in death? And we asked God for mercy and God gave us mercy. You understand what I'm saying? All hell was breaking out. Mercy, God. Mercy is what lessens consequences. Your disobedience sets consequences in order, okay? But mercy can lessen consequences. Even with someone as wicked as Ahab, 
Ahab and Jezebel, oh, what a pair, okay? You know, and when, when the prophet came to Ahab and told him what God was going to do, Ahab repented before God. God turned the prophet around and said, look at what Ahab did. He sends him around and says, I will not bring this wickedness in your time. What did God just give him? Mercy. But it will happen in your children's time. You want to know why? Because the children saw the deeds of the parents and what did they continue doing? Those bad deeds. So now they reap the consequences. You understand what I'm 